C. Peter Wagner coined the term third wave. Have you ever heard that term before, third wave? By that he meant the first wave was the Pentecostal movement at the turn of the century, which I'm going to be talking more about this on Friday night. You're not going to want to miss it. The second wave of the Spirit was the charismatic outpouring. And then the third wave of the Spirit originated with John Wimber and his famous MC 510 Signs and Wonders in Church Growth uh, uh, class in 1980 at Fuller Theological Seminary. And there are a few unique aspects of the third wave movement, although uh, scholars are actually saying they have blended so much together today that it's hard to tell the difference. But Wagner also called John Wimber the molder of a generation. Do you believe that? And designated him as the fountainhead of the third wave movement. And Carol Wimber, uh, the, the wife of John Wimber, said, God has a blueprint for revival, and he gave it to John Wimber. Now, if that's true, would you like to know the blueprint? Yes. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about that. Dr. Clark is not here, but he says, His life was changed when I met John Wimber. He said, I received an impartation from him when Wimber, from Wimber when he spoke a prophecy that became an anchor tied to my personal destiny. He said that he has tied, I'm sorry, he says that he has tried to be a spiritual son who has honored his spiritual father, John Wimber. And he said, it's not difficult to see my indebtedness to Wimber in my conferences, training schools, certification programs, seminary courses. My foundational messages are from him. And I love the fact that he says, Dr. Clark says, that he tries to be a good spiritual son to his spiritual father. The Apostle Paul says in chapter 6 of Ephesians, Honor your fathers and your mothers, and it will go well with you. It is really important when we honor our spiritual mothers and our fathers. They dig wells that we can drink from. They put deposits in the spirit realm that we can take, and we can stand on their shoulders and go farther. And that's truly what God wants us to do. And so... There are there's spiritual DNA, I believe, in John Wimber that God wants us to, to understand and integrate those into our lives so that we can be prepared for the next wave of the Spirit. Hey guys, we'll be right back to the message. I just wanted to let you know that Voice of the Apostles, one of our flagship conferences, is happening soon. We have amazing speakers, including Bill Johnson, Heidi Baker, Dr. Randy Clark, and many others. We'd love to see you there in person, but if you can't make it, you can also attend online. Click the link to learn more. Now back to the message. So who was John Wimber? There's people here that know him. There are people here. How many of you really don't know anything about John Wimber? There's a lot of hands. It's so exciting. Let me tell you a little bit about this amazing man. And I could talk about him for hours, but in order to narrow the topic, and we always have to narrow the topic, right? I'm going to narrow the topic down to what God taught John Wimber, some very narrow principles that God taught him that you can apply to your life. But first, let me tell you a little bit about his background. He said that he was a fourth-generation pagan. He came from a pagan pool. He said uh, he only knew Jesus as a cuss word. He said he didn't even know God had a book out. <laughs> Carol told him he had a book out, and she, he said, well, what's the name of it? He said, it's the Bible. He said, God wrote that book? He was a successful musician that worked with the Righteous Brothers in Las Vegas. And then he had a dramatic conversion in 1963. Uh, he was in a, a uh, little, little Bible study group. And um, he said, I don't know if somebody pushed me 
Or if I just kind of fell, but he said, I'm on the floor all of a sudden and I'm blubbering and snots all over the place and I'm crying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's the only thing that he knew how to pray. And he said, all of a sudden he had this vision. He said, I saw, which he had actually seen in downtown Los Angeles at some point, a man who had a sandwich board, you know, the kind that's on your back, the straps, and then on the front. And he said, on the front of that sandwich board, it said, I'm a fool for Christ. And on the back, it said, whose fool are you? And he said from that moment on, he knew that his calling and his destiny would be to be a fool for Christ. And then he said, you know, a little bit later in this same Bible study class, they were talking about the pearl of great price. And he said uh, he was listening to that. And, and he said to the, the, the teacher, he said, um, let's just say there's a guy. Who, he's only good at one thing. Um, would God ever ask him to give up that one thing? If that's all he could do? And the Bible teacher, which is, which is Gunnar Payne, said, uh, knowing who that one guy was, of course. Well, if God asked him to, he'd have to be willing to. And Wimber leaned back, hung his head down and said, yeah, I thought so. And he took everything that he had related to his music, all of his writing, all of his material, everything. He put it in boxes and he took it to the city dump and he got rid of it all. He didn't have a call at that point that he knew of. He didn't have another place to go, another thing to do. But he walked away from the bright lights of the night and he took a job during the day with an alarm clock waking him up at the early morning hours and putting his hands in a dirty drum. And the, for the first time in his life, he had to have a job where he got his hands dirty. He had bought the pearl of great price. And then he started reading his Bible. Now remember, he, he just found out God had a book out, right? And so he's reading the Bible and reading the Gospels with childlike lenses. He looks at this and he's thinking, what Jesus does, the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to do what Jesus did. So he goes to church and he's thinking, the church is going to study about Jesus. And then they're all going to go out and they're going to do the stuff that Jesus does. And so he didn't see it happening. And he started asking the leaders, when, when do we get to do the stuff that Jesus did? And they're like, what stuff? And he says, you know, the cool stuff, you know, raise the dead, cast out demons, water into wine, all that kind of stuff. When do we get to do that? And they said, oh, we don't, we don't do that anymore. Well, why not? Why not? And they said, well, you know, he said, actually, he said, I'm thinking, when I worked for the devil, I got to do what the devil did. How come I can't do what Jesus did? He said, I pretty soon figured out that people like to, churches like to sing about it. They like to talk about it. They like to pray about it, sometimes cry about it, but they never want to go do it. And he said, all of a sudden, church kind of got boring, but he stuck with it. And then he said, I, I came to the Lord under this man named Gunnar Payne, who was an amazing soul winner. And he said, Gunnar would take me around, all around your Belinda. He said, I'd knock on, we'd knock on doors, one door after another, winning people to the Lord. And he said, Gunnar was this an avid soul winner. And he was just so amazed with him. He said, I walked beside him. He said, I started telling the stories that Gunnar told. I talked like Gunnar. I walked like Gunnar. I did everything that Gunnar did. And he said, in the first three years, he had won between four and 500 people to the Lord. Yeah, that's a pretty amazing. He said, I accidentally got filled with the Holy Spirit one time. <laughs> he said, I was, he said, there's a nice 
businessman who laid hands on me and prayed that I'd be filled with the Holy Spirit. He said nothing happened. But a few days later, I was out walking by this ditch, pouring my heart out to the Lord. And, and he said, all of a sudden, I started speaking in another language, in other tongues. He said, now, by this time, they had been taught that the gifts of the Spirit ceased. And so he said, when Carol heard that he's him speaking in tongues and he was filled with the Holy Spirit, she said, uh-oh, the devil's got you. And he said, well, I didn't mean to let the devil get me. And so he said, after, you know, every once in a while through the years, he said, I'd check. And sure enough, I was, you know, he says, once the devil gets you, it's really hard to get rid of him. So he was a member of the Quaker church, which believed that the gifts of the Spirit ceased. They were cessationists. And so they sent him off to Bible school because they saw the call of God in his life, all these people that he won to the Lord. And at Bible school, he was talked out of a supernaturalistic worldview. In other words, everything that he was seeing in the Bible, they couldn't do. And he said he became a hardcore cessationist. And eventually, he became the pastor of the church. He grew it to the largest in the Quaker denomination. And he had led most of those people to the Lord himself. And he said, I, he just struggled to fit into the system. Now, understanding that he was a baby boomer that had entertained baby boomers all of his life. And so he had this different way about him. He had this different musical ear. He said, you know, in the church, he said, I struggled to fit in like with the dress, you know, the way they dress, the choir, the music, everything. He said, we sang Beulah Land forever before I figured out what they were talking about. <laughs> and then the Christianese, he said, I was worried when they'd make me be washed in the blood. And then finally, 12 years, he said, after 12 years of pastoring, and my fingerprints, he said, was all over this church. He said, I, I, he said, I, I just burned out. He said, I loved God. I loved the people. They loved me. But he said, I didn't even want to attend the church I was pastoring. <laughs> That's bad. He said, uh, he was taking the doctoral ministry classes at Fuller Theological Seminary under C. Peter Wagner was his professor. And he said that um, he, Wagner invited him to be the director of the Charles E. Fuller Institute of Evangelism and Church Growth. W Wagner had the theory, but he saw in Wimber the, uh, the practitioner, the ability to put theory into practice. And so he invited him to work with him with Fuller. And so they teamed up together as church growth consultants. And he said that well, they transgressed across America and into Canada, uh, hundreds of churches across the denominational spectrum. And he said, after about four years, I was burned out again. Second burnout. After almost four years, he said, there was a lot of action that we called the work of the Holy Spirit. But it was nothing more than human effort in which Holy Spirit was asked to tag along. Hmm. So one night he was flying in to Detroit. Just picture this. Probably some of you can imagine. He's got his head laying against the side of the airplane cabin and he's looking out the window. He's flying into Detroit, Michigan, another city that he doesn't know anybody. His family is back in California. And he said, I'm just feeling this burned out, empty feeling. He went to his hotel room. He said, I finally opened my Bible and knelt down beside the bed just to have some private devotional time, something he said I just don't feel like I'd had in a long time. Kneeling beside the bed, he said he fell asleep in that position. And he woke up in the middle of the night and he heard the Lord say to him, I've seen your ministry now let me show you mine. How many of you would like to see God's ministry? Woo! 
Well, he said he quit his job right then as a church growth consultant with Fuller. He went back to California. Long story short, he started pastoring that little church of about 50 people, that little house church. And there he began his journey with God. God was going to teach him things that would literally shift his paradigm and launch him into a signs and wonders ministry that would ultimately start the third wave of renewal and spark revival around the world. Two ways that God taught him. Through the mind, you do have to have the mind of Christ. You do have to begin to understand this book Revelation knowledge. But it also, you have to have that experience in your heart. There has to be experiential knowledge. And that's exactly the, the, the two-lane road that God is taking Wimber down now for the next few years of his life that will come out in that funnel on the other side that will give us some information that we can apply to our own life, okay? This reminds me of Robert Clinton's book, The Making of a Leader, Clinton says that God, at some, God takes everything that we have learned, everything that we have experienced in our Christian life, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's our failures, things that we're ashamed of, things that we're really proud of, whatever it is, he takes those experiences. And if we will stay submitted to him, and if we will allow him, he will take these and bring us to the place of convergence, a place where it all comes together, it all fits. Now, at any point along the way, and when the pain gets too great, we can say, I want to stop. I'm not going on any farther. And God will allow us to do that and let us park right where we are. And a lot of people wonder, why don't I ever come into the fullness of my destiny? We just have to keep saying yes. Just keep saying yes. Because he's able to cir circuitously bring us back on path if we will just keep saying yes in the face of pain. And there will be pain in the offering. So, convergence. That's what God wants to bring. And that's exactly what's happening now in Wimber's life. His music career... His pastoring, his consulting, it's all good stuff that he's learned. And God is bringing him to this place where he can mold him into that more vessel and show him God's ministry. So the first thing that God did was and to show him his ministry was take him back and show him the ministry of God. Jesus, that's exactly right. Now, this is significant. Taking Wimber back to the Gospels and showing him the ministry of Jesus. It's really important, okay? I'm going to get a little bit technical, but it's going to be worth it, okay? Just a, little tiny, just a little tiny technical paragraph here, okay? Evangelicals look to Paul, the apostle, in the epistles to formulate doctrine. The epistles are didactic. In other words, they, that you would say they are prescriptive. They, they teach. They're teaching. And therefore, you can take the epistles and use them to formulate doctrine. On the other hand, evangelicals say that the gospels are descriptive. They are simply describing history and what's taking place. And they say that historical books cannot be used to formulate doctrine. So what does that do? It strips the guts right out of the gospel and the ministry of Jesus. Right? And so we end up with a hermeneutic that puts the lens of Apostle Paul on and reads and dissects the works of Jesus. We read Jesus through the eyes of Paul. That's a good place to pause. I'll do that Bill Johnson thing. believe that we can use 
historical genre like the Gospels and Acts. But they primarily look at the book of Luke and Acts to substantiate or support their understanding of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wimber was about to discover that God has a different perspective. Now, that was a good wow. (laughs) Wimber was about to discover that God has a different perspective than the evangelicals and the Pentecostals. So, the Lord took Wimber back to Matthew 9, 1 through 8. Remember the story of the paralytic where they tore off the roof, which the board members probably in this church would be really upset about. They let the man down, right, in front of Jesus. And Jesus said to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Rise, take your mat and walk. Well, the people were excited. The man was excited, but the Pharisees were not very excited, right? So Jesus said to them, which is easier, to forgive sins or to, say, be healed? There's not an evangelical church probably around that wouldn't say, if you have an altar call, people come down, they cry and they repent, and you would say, oh, your sins are forgiven, go home. Right? But if any one of those people came down and said, I have terminal cancer, will you pray for me? They would say, well, if it be God's will. Right? But Jesus is saying here, he's kind of tying it together, right? So God asked John at that point, how can you be assured the forgiveness of sin that you cannot measure when you cannot believe for healing that you can measure? And Wimber, you know, scratching his head and thinking about it, and he goes, Well, what about the people that don't get healed? And Jesus or the Father said to him, what about people that don't get saved? So he realized at that moment that God had tied healing and salvation together. Right then, he said, I realize that. Remember the evangelist. Just as I was responsible for preaching the gospel, God was holding me accountable for praying for the sick in equal measure. He said, I understood that God wanted people healed, spirit, soul, and body. Needless to say, this is a major paradigm shift for Wimber. Then God, taking him another step, said... Let me show you the ministry. Took him to John 14, 12. If you have faith in me, you will, be, you will do what I've been doing, Jesus said. If you have faith in me, you'll do what I've been doing. So what's, what's Jesus been doing? Well, it says Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon possessed, having seizures, those paralyzed, and he healed them. That's what Jesus did. He proclaimed the good news of the kingdom. He healed every disease and sickness. And Wimber said, when I saw that, it hit me really hard And he thought, I've only been doing half the job. He says, I preach the gospel, but I've never done the works that Jesus did. And he loved to hold up a menu. And he'd say, it would be like going into a restaurant, studying the menu, memorizing the menu, but never ordering a meal and eating. Or it would be like taking a scuba diving class and reading all the books and studying all the equipment but never getting in the water. 
He said, that is really the sum total of my ministry. And he said, at that moment, the gospels ceased being history books and became my job description. They stopped being history books and became my job description. So the model of God's ministry is Jesus. You see, he realized that Jesus is the leader. Therefore, we need to follow the leader. So not only do we get to do the stuff that Jesus did, we're actually called and commissioned to do the stuff that Jesus did. It's not enough to take this book and highlight it and underline it and memorize it. We're supposed to, this is our training manual. This is our training manual. We're supposed to take this book, see what Jesus did, and go out and do the stuff that Jesus did. (laughs) Jesus says, if you believe in me, the works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than these will you do because I go to my Father. When we realize that we simply need to take Jesus at his word. Jesus is the one sent from the Father to teach us what the Father looks like. He says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So his mission is our commission. And that day, he said, he was sitting in the fuller yard perusing through his Bible, and when he saw this revelation, he said, I wrote in my Bible, I must learn to do what Jesus did. We need to learn to do what Jesus did. Well, what this did was, This is basically the stuff that God taught him. And now he's getting ready to launch out into a painful learning curve. How many of you know when you get a revelation from the Lord, sometimes the one following that wonderful revelation is a painful learning curve. As you try to do what God has revealed to you to do. And that's exactly what happened. He said his church, he started teaching through the gospel of Luke. He said we started praying for the sick. Problem is, nobody got healed. As a matter of fact, we started getting the colds that people came forward with. We started getting their sicknesses. (laughs) He said, I was so frustrated. I said, I'm not going to pray for these sick people anymore. God said, preach my word or get out. And he said, how far out? Out of the ministry? Out of the kingdom? And the Lord said to him, Preach my word, not your non experience. He said, Well, that was a twist. He said, You know, evangelicals chide Pentecostals for preaching their experience. And now he said, God is chiding me for preaching my non experience. See, just because we don't see anybody get healed when we pray for them, that doesn't alleviate the fact that it's still our job to heal the sick. He said, after nine months of praying for the sick and nobody getting healed, he said, I was so frustrated. He said, one morning I get this phone call from this man and that new couple in our church. And he said, my wife is sick in bed and I've got to go to work and we have kids and you need to come and heal her. (laughs) He said, I stormed out the back door. He said, I didn't exactly raise my fist to God, but he said, I did that Italian thing like I've just received a box of bad goods. He said, what? And he said, 
I went in that, the couple's house. The woman, she was really sick. He said, no, but no woman would let a man see her the way she looked unless he was really, she was really sick. So he said, I, I've said a quick prayer, turned around to tell her husband why not everybody gets healed. And I'd gotten really good at telling that story. And he said, the man was looking over his shoulder, smiling. And he said, what are you looking at? And he turned around and looked, and the woman was up making the bed. And, and he said, what are you doing? What happened to you? <laughs> she said, well, you healed me. And they asked him to stay for breakfast, and he said, I was so dumbfounded. that he said, I just turned around and staggered out of the house. And he said, about halfway across the lawn, it hit me all of a sudden. She's healed. And he said, whoo, he clicked his heels and said, we got one. He said, on the way home, he saw this vision, open vision. Now, I can't imagine God giving you a vision on the L.A. freeway. What are you thinking, God? And he said, he said, he pulled over, smart move, pulled over to get a better look at what he was seeing. And he said, it looked like a cloud bank. And all of a sudden he realized that it was a honeycomb and raining down from this honeycomb was honey, drips of honey. And he said, there were some people that they were getting this honey on them and they're going, ee, ee, ee. they didn't like it. And he said there were other people it was raining on and they were so excited that they were taking it in and giving it away to other people. And God spoke to him and said, John, that's my mercy. Healing and salvation is poured out for everyone. That mercy of God rains down for everybody. He said, God said, there's plenty for everyone. Don't ever beg for my mercy again. He said, the problem's not up here. The problem's down there. He said that another revelation that transformed his life, and he never saw healing again after that. From that moment on, he knew it was God's will to heal, and God wanted people healed, spirit, soul, and body. He said, the key, don't you love keys? Want to know a key? He said, the key was believing in God's mercy. So he went from believing that God could heal to believing that we're actually commissioned to heal the sick. Let that sink in. You know, I grew up Pentecostal all my life. I was born into Pentecostalism. I was under this impression that you can have a healing ministry if you prayed enough and fasted enough and cried enough and waited long enough and you worked hard enough and you proved yourself long enough. That maybe at some point when you got good enough, you could have a healing ministry, maybe. Anybody identify with that? You see, I realize now God has already commissioned you. You don't have to beg God for a healing ministry. It's already yours. Step out and do the stuff. The ministry of Jesus is our ministry. That's what we're supposed to go do. That's why I said faith is spelled R-I-S-K. You just have to step out. Well, John never wanted to build a healing ministry around himself. He didn't like that Pentecostal model of one man on stage, the man of faith and power for the hour. His goal from the very beginning was to build an audience, not an audience. He didn't want to build an audience. He wanted to build an army. Pastors. 
It's not about us being the great people of God that's going to lay hands on the sick. We don't want followers. We want disciples. We want to raise up an army, not pew potatoes. We are called in that Ephesians 4 model to train and equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. Wimber's heart was to give it all away. And he realized that if we have a model, if the people have a model, that they can follow that model and they can be activated more quickly into doing the stuff that Jesus did. So he found the model in Jesus. Jesus would take his disciples along with him demonstrate how to do the stuff and then he after they they he demonstrated they get them doing the stuff and then after they did the stuff then he would send them out so that they could do it on their own and when they come back they would report back to him what they did doesn't that kind of sound like the model that you're doing that's called the clinic model that he developed teach Demonstrate, get people praying, coach them. It's that five-step prayer model that Charity so beautifully taught on this morning. It's called activation and impartation. He said everybody gets to play. Everybody gets to do the stuff. Everybody gets to do the stuff. So through the process, God was faithful to his promise, to, I said, when he said, I've seen your ministry, now let me show you mine. So John went through some major paradigm shifts through studying the scripture, applying it all, and putting into practice. I'm just about, how much time do I have? I have 18 minutes. Y'all pray. I told you I talk fast. I got to talk faster than I'm talking. Next, God showed him the message of Jesus. He showed him the ministry of Jesus. Now, what's the message of Jesus? What was the first message that Jesus preached? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Is that right? So, so he understood that that was the central message of Jesus. And that everything that Jesus did from that point of on, all of his teaching, all of the parables, all of the stories, all of the healings, all of the casting out of demons, all of the miracles, everything was to underscore and enlighten his one central thesis. And that was that the kingdom of God had come in the person of Jesus Christ. It's all about the kingdom. And then he led him to Matthew chapter 12. Remember, there was a, a Jesus healed the demon-possessed man that was blind and mute. And the Pharisees accused him of driving out demons by the prince of demons, right? And what was Jesus' response? He said, if Satan drives out demons, he's divided against himself. How can the kingdom stand, right? And on the other hand, Jesus went on to say that since... I drive out demons by the Spirit of God. Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. In other words, when Jesus announced that the kingdom of God had come, it was a declaration of war. It was a declaration of war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. In other words, this is not a civil war. Jesus is saying the stronger one has come and tied up or curbed the power of the weaker one so that you can plunder his house. So when Jesus, 
the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God has invaded the kingdom of Satan. Jesus is the divine invader sent by God for one purpose, and that is to defeat Satan. And Jesus accomplished it in his life and in his ministry through healings and casting out demons and signs and wonders and miracles, and ultimately through his death and his resurrection and his ascension. Everything served to demonstrate one thing, that Jesus is the victor. All this stuff that Jesus was doing were signs that Satan's power was broken and God's kingdom had come. Jesus was the stronger. He tied up the strong man. Beloved, hear that. He's the stronger one who has tied up. And, and you have the privilege of plundering his goods. And the war is still going on. It really gets to me whenever people say, oh, you know, and I know positive confession. I do that myself. I watch my mouth. I watch my words. I say the, the, try to say the things that come into agreement with God. But beloved, there is still a war going on. We still have to do battle. We still have to fight. And if you don't understand that, you're going to get really confused when bad things happen. You have to still stand, but we, we have the power and the authority in the name of Jesus. And, and Wimber liked to use the illustration by Oscar Coleman, who during World War II, the victory of World War II was decided on D-Day when the Allied forces stormed the beaches of Normandy. Everybody knew the war was basically over, but it would take another 11 months before VE Day until Germany finally surrendered and there was victory in Europe. But between that period of time, when the, uh, in D-Day, when the Allied forces hit the beaches, and when VE Day, the armistice was finally signed, whenever they finally, enemies finally surrendered, during those 11 months, there was still a lot of battles. And as a matter of fact, there were more lives that were lost in that 11 months than in the entire war. And so what he understood from that is that the battle still rages. We are in that between time. Jesus has already come in his first coming of the kingdom. He has bound the strong man. He has tied him up. He has tethered him so that you and I can plunder his goods. But we are also, he has not been completely cast out and removed from the earth. We still have to deal with an enemy. But we, it's, he has given us the power and the authority to take back all of the captives. And that's his expectation. So when you and I, so when you and I pray for somebody and they're healed, we've plundered the enemy's camp. When we cast out a demon, when we lead somebody to Christ, beloved, we are infiltrating the enemy's camp. We're in plundering. So why wouldn't the enemy try to convince you that you're not supposed to heal the sick? That's mental warfare that's going on. That's why you've got to understand the truth of God's word. We're supposed to do the ministry of Jesus. And he's given us the power and the authority to do that. So bottom line, his ministry is the ministry of Jesus. We see it in the gospels. It's our job description. It's our job description. We're supposed to proclaim the good news of Jesus. The message of the kingdom of God is at hand. We're to demonstrate the presence of the kingdom and do the works that Jesus did. That's our job because Jesus, the stronger one, has come, tied him up. And now we are the army of God. That we are to go and plunder the enemy's camp and take captives and set them free. Yes. 
That became the material of MC 510, Signs and Wonders and Church Growth. That the first semester, they expected 45 people, 80 people signed up. Then Christian Life Magazine ran a whole article, whole magazine on him. The next time they offered the class, 279 people signed up. The biggest class that Fuller had ever had, so big that they didn't have a room to contain the students and they had to move it into a church off campus. The dean of the School of Theology said, I only know two seminary courses that have been so famous. One was Karl Barth's class on dogmatics and John Wimber's MC 510 at Fuller. He took that material, turned it into a Signs and Wonders Church Growth Conference, turned it into Equipping the Saints, turned it into his book Power Evangelism, Power Healing, and ultimately launched the Third Wave Movement. That's boiling it all down into a capsule that I didn't want this to be a history lesson for you, just a history lesson. I love history. Isn't history exciting? That's a sign up for my GATS class. <laughs> but I want you to apply what we've talked about today. When God showed Wimber, this is what my ministry looked like. It took him back to the Gospels where he learned all of this stuff. Keep the main thing, the main thing. His message is the kingdom of God and his ministry is to plunder the enemy's house. We're to bring the rule and the reign of God to earth. We're to demonstrate the power of God. We're to reveal God's love and mercy by healing the stick and doing the ministry of Jesus. Every great move of God has been a rediscovery, a rediscovery of some truth that is in the book. It's all in here. Pentecostals used to ask John Wimber, did you have some kind of a divine visitation from an angel to launch you into the signs and wonders and min miracle ministry? He said, no, and it's the truth. He said, no, I just read the book. It's all right here, he said. Just read the book. Go back to the Gospels and read the book. When we get back to the message of Jesus, I believe we're going to see another wave of the Spirit. Oh! We're due for another wave. And I'm, I think God has brought you here today to, to hear this message so that you will be prepared to realize and understand how you can step into this new wave. I believe you're going to be some of the people that begin the wave. Who was it that said, if the Holy Spirit's not moving, I move. I move the Holy Spirit, right? Smith Wigglesworth. If the wave's not going, let's create a wave. And that's what this whole conference is about. To activate you. To get you prepared to be and do what Jesus is calling us to be and do. Would you stand with me? I've Six minutes. I can't believe it. This is amazing. See, I believe that you are here by divine decree and by divine appointment. Because there is a deposit, a spiritual deposit in the spiritual atmosphere of this house. John Wimber, this was his house. John Wimber stood in this pulpit and he declared the things that I'm declaring to you this morning. And 
I believe that if he were here, he would say to you, go back and get in the Gospels. Go back and read the stories of Jesus and believe that God wants you to do it. That's your activation commission today. That's your activation commission. Just go do the stuff because everybody gets to play. God wants you to do it. And if you hear anything in your mind that says the opposite, who do you think it's coming from?